Hello and welcome to my presentation on the phosphorus and sulfur cycle as part of ecology and of course the topic, um, the subject of biology. If you're interested in it, keep watching and I hope you enjoy. So first of all, talk about the four main aspects I'll be talking about in the duration of this video. So first we'll start off with the biogeochemical cycle. Then we move on to the phosphorus cycle and the sulfur cycle. And lastly, the human impact to ecology in regards to those two cycles. And what I'll be specifically talking about um, for the biogeochemical cycle, and that's a difficult word to pronounce, <laughs> um, I'll give you a definition. Well, I'll give you a definition for each cycle, but I'll also give you the classes of biochemical cycles. For the phosphorus cycle, I'll do the same, except I'll also talk about um, the specific phosphorus cycle, its biological functions, and I'll give you some diagrams on which I'll um, illustrate exactly what the phosphorus cycle is there for. Um, and then we'll move on to the sulfur cycle, where I'll say the same in regards to, you know, sulfur. And lastly, I'll also differentiate bef between phosphorus and sulfur regarding the human impact and of course as always in the end i'll show you my sources for this presentation so if you want to do some additional research or if you need it um, for a presentation yourself feel free to screenshot and use them whatever you deem necessary so yeah starting off with the definition for the biogeochemical cycle is a pathway by which a chemical substance moves through biotic and abiotic compartments of the earth and this definition of the chemical cycle um, is also necessary when we differentiate the classes of the biochemical cycles or the biogeochemical cycles. So like that, each biochemical cycle can be considered as having a reservoir pool, um, meaning a pool um, of reserves of, of nutrients necessary. And it's generally large, slow moving and abiotic. And then on the other side, we have the exchange pool or the cycling pool, which is smaller, more active and has a more rapid exchange between biotic and abiotic aspects of an ecosystem. And there we also differentiate between the gaseous and the sedimentary biochemical cycles. So for the gaseous, um, the reservoir is in the air or through evaporation from the ocean and it moves relatively rapidly and the adaptation to changes in the biosphere are also ra more rapid. And then on the other hand, we have the sedimentary, which describes the reservoir in the Earth's crust. And there are varied cycles depending on the different minerals, though they have the same fundamental concept. Um, moving on, um, the phosphorus cycle is the process in which phosphorus moves through the litho, hydro and biosphere. And I also define, you know, what each one of those spheres means. Um, yeah, here you can see the um, phosphorus in the periodic table. And starting off with the lithosphere, it's described as the solid, rocky outer part of the Earth's crust, including the brittle upper portion of the mantle and crust. Um, then we have the hydrosphere, the mass of water found on, under and above the surface of the planet. Um, basically the total amount of water on a planet. And lastly, we have the biosphere, describing all ecosystems and zones of life on Earth. So all parts of the Earth where life exists or can exist. Yes, and phosphorus biological functions are integral to life in general because it, or at least carbon-based life as we know it. Um, because of it forms the nucleotides as the backbone of the DNA. So if you imagine the con um, the formation um, of the structure of the DNA, you know that there is a phosphorus backbone without which the DNA could not be held up as we know it. So it's basically the backbone of life. And additionally, it's also a component of bones and teeth in mammals also an important part of that, and also the phospholipid membranes of cells. So we have the DNA, 
the cells and you know bones and teeth but it basically makes up life and yeah the organisms necessary for life um, when we talk about the phosphorus cycle we have three main you know um, aspects uh, the three main stages of the phosphorus cycle as I might say first of all we have weathering which is the extraction extraction of phosphorus from rocks through the weather events that wash it into the soil. Then we have the absorption, which is um, the process in which phosphorus in the soil can be absorbed by plants, fungi and microorganisms. Um, then it gets into water systems where plants and animals can absorb it. And last we have decomposition where phosphorus is returned in the water and so after the organism is decomposed from where on it can be reused and the cycle starts anew. That's why it's a cycle. This all can be seen in this beautiful diagram by the um, Encyclopedia um, Britannica where we have the runoff, the um, weathering and the absorption. We have the weathering here let's say, then we have the absorption in the water and then the uptake or the decomposition as we can see here in marine sedimentation and the organic decomposition and everything is interconnected as you can see by this diagram. Now we get to the sulfur cycle, um, which is the circulation of sulfur in various forms through nature. So similarly to phosphorus, but just with sulfur. Um, and I'll start with the biological functions of sulfur for change. So first of all, it's occurring in abundance. It occurs in all living organisms as a component of certain amino acids. So again, an integral part of life to living organism or at least carbon-based organisms that we know of. Um, it's also integral to processes. So um, it contains both atmospheric and it's, it's contained in both atmospheric and terrestrial processes. It can also be used as a fertilizer that has a positive effect as a component. And I actually wrote an essay on it on ferrous sulfate. Um, quite interesting if you're interested in gardening and all of that. Um, well, yeah, moving on. It's also a component of acid rain. And wait, acid rain is actually a mixture of wet and dry depositive material from the atmosphere containing a higher than normal amounts of nitric and sulfuric acid. And it's the product when hydrogen sulfide dissolves in water to sulfurous and sulfuric acid. Yes. So here we have the same diagram, but with the sulfur cycle, beginning with weathering, which is the, again, the extraction of something, the extraction of sulfur from the rocks through weather and events that wash it into the soil. Then we have the conversion, which is an additional step to the phosphorus, uh, when compared to the phosphorus cycle. The conversion after contact with oxygen, it is con uh, converted into sulfate, so it can uh, go into more molecular bindings um, and yeah, molecular structures. Then we have the absorption. The sulfate is taken up by plants and microorganisms and then passed along the trophic levels. And trophic levels are a term that you see uh, is reoccurring when talking about ecology. Um, yeah, and decomposition. Phosphorus is returned in the water and soil after the organism is decomposed and it can be reused. Again, cycles. Now here we see um, the same diagram but for sulfur. So we have the weathering, the runoff, sedimentation and sulfate and sulfides, the runoff. Then here somewhere it's turned into through oxygen into sulfate. And from then on it's absorbed throughout the trophic levels. And yeah, it's then decomposed and can be used again. And what I'd also like to say about the sulfur cycle is that eventually it settles back into the earth or through rain and continuous loss of sulfur from terrestrial ecosystems runoff through the drainage into the lakes and oceans um, can also occur to fallout of the atmosphere. Um, sulfur in marine communities um, also moves through the food chain as I mentioned with the trophic levels 
and it's emitted back into the atmosphere through um, sea spray, for example. And the remaining sulfur in the ocean, together with iron, forms this ferrous sulfur, uh, sulfur again a fertilizer, um, but it also gives the black color of marine sediments that have been seen under there. And natural sources for sulfur in the atmosphere also include volcanic um, activity, as we can see here, and swamps as well as evaporation of water. But here on the left hand side, you also see the smelting and burning of fossil fuels as a main component of sulfur in the atmosphere. Now, this all can be seen in this. Well, I don't want to call it more simplified because it looks more complicated, but um, it's a different diagram than the last one. And here, if you screenshot it and if you stop it, you can see in a more detailed version of the interplay of the sulfur cycle with the emission, the deposition, gasification, and all of that. Yeah. Coming to the human impact, starting with phosphorus. It's mined for fertilizer and transported into cities and farms. So both phosphorus and sulfur are used for fertilizers. Um, and excessive amounts of nutrients harm the e aquatic ecosystem. And this culminates into a phase. I don't want to call it a phase, but in a phenomenon called eutrophication or dystrophication or even hypertrophication and these are different levels of a body of water body of water becoming overly full of minerals and nutrients such as phosphorus which leads to excessive growth of algae this leads because you know the algae consumes oxygen this leads to oxygen depletion in that body of water and that then culminates and results to anoxic water, so-called anoxic waters, and no oxic, oxygen, depletion of oxygen, yeah. Um, and this anthropogenic, so human-made eutrophication leads to this lack of oxygen and anoxic waters, uh, which then in turn lead to increased death rates of species and habitat and in ecosystems you know the biodiversity is a main component of ecosystems excessive amount of fertilizer can cause imbalance of the naturally occurring minerals additionally not only for the ecosystem so it's overall harmful if they're in the excessive amount and the same can be said for the sulfur and the human impact for sulfur is also that fossil fuels increase the amount of sulfur in the atmosphere and the ocean so not only the ocean and they deplete sedimentary rock that sinks through the mining of sulfur um, additionally sulfur in the atmosphere acts like an air pollutant so it's not only harmful to the marine ecosystem but also to you know the gaseous ecosystem and it reacts with water to sulfuric acid and as we remember with oxygen it turns into sulfate here it turns into sulfuric acid lowering the ph value and causing damage to various system and the sulfuric acid is also the component of you know astray usage of sulfur as fertilizer can also cause sulfur deficiency as um, a deficiency of naturally occurring sulfur because of the added sulfur and this these are some of the key points to talk about when talking about the phosphorus and the sulfur cycle in ecology i thank you for listening once again if you even stayed that long um and yeah thank you very much these are my sources and yeah thank you have a nice one